All right, so uh, we'll start with a, a case. So Mike has, has volunteered to, um, to walk us through this. So, so Mike, uh, you're referred to a 62-year-old man with a history of hypertension and a 30-pack year history of smoking who comes to you with a 1.8 centimeter right upper lobe nodule that was discovered on a screening exam for lung cancer. Um, his PCP has already referred him for a needle biopsy that came back as adenocarcinoma. Uh, and this is the scan that he comes to clinic with. Can you describe the findings and then what additional history do you want? I think you're muted, Mike. Sorry. Um, so it appears to be a speculated solid nodule, and um, I will I will get a full history. I I would like to know if there's any prior malignancies or any family history of cancer. And, and since I already know the social history, he's a high risk of, for um, lung cancer, which is already bi bi pro biopsy proven. And um, then at this at this point, since I already have my diagnosis, um, the question will be whether on the CT scan there's any 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 sizable lymph nodes, or I'll, and I'll proceed to the PET CT scan. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he he really has uh, no symptoms. He has no personal or family history of of malignancy. Uh, I gave you the the smoking history there. He's maybe lost a couple of pounds recently. Um, and then on this CT scan, there's no appreciable lymphadenopathy that you can see. All right, so what are your, your next steps in terms of the workup of this patient? So I you mentioned the PET scan, but yeah, what else so would you want to do? So I, you know, I like to stage him, and if, if the PET scan reveals any, um, any uptake, I would obviously, I, I'll discuss with him that he's going to need re resection if there's no evidence of metastasis, and I'll also get um, EFTs, lung function tests. Okay, great. So uh, let's say you get a, a set of labs, they're normal, um, EKG is sinus rhythm, there are your, your PFTs, and this is the, the PET scan that you, that you get, so you can see an FDG AVID lesion uh, corresponding to what you saw on the, the CT, um, and then there's no additional mediastinal or hyalur uptake uh, and no distant disease on his PET CT. Okay, so I uh, we're dealing with a stage one cancer, um, specifically um, you know, this would be a, a T1D and zero. Um, it's 1.8 centimeter, and it's um, it's located. I think where, this is an anterior segment of the right upper lobe, and uh, his lung function appears his FEV1 uh, and his ZLCO are appropriate. Uh, I will discuss the options for resection, um, anatomic resection with him, and uh, ideally a, a right arpal lobectomy, or that's right arpal lobectomy. I would not stage his mediastinum since I have no evidence or suggest, suggestion. Okay, so let me, uh, let me stop you right there. That's kind of where we're going next, but... Um, yeah. You know, you talked about staging last week and, and gave a, a really nice talk, but I wanted to just kind of emphasize and, and, and talk about a couple of points specifically as they relate to stage one lung cancer. Um, so the first question is, would you perform a, a brain MRI as part of your staging workup? I would not perform for stage one. Definitely, um, I, I believe for stage one, it's not, unless there's any neurologic symptoms, Great. So I agree with you. Um, and then if you look at the, the NCCN and some other guidelines, um, these are the, the criteria for when they do recommend a brain MRI as part of the workup. So of course, if the patient has a focal or new neurologic symptoms, um, if it's a stage two or higher uh, lung cancer, so a T3 uh, lesion, and then for 1B, uh, a brain MRI is, is considered optional. I would just get in the habit of always saying clinical stage one clinical, this for is not clinical, pathologic right. stage one. That's an important thing to say on the boards. Yeah. Okay, absolutely. Um, and Andrew, then Mike- you, you, may, you may also want to consider histology, so large cell, small cell. Uh, that might also make you get an MRI. Okay, so you would do that regardless of the tumor for the, the more aggressive pathology, histologies? I, I tend to. Okay, all right. Great, and then uh, Mike, you had mentioned this earlier, but would you perform invasive mediastinal staging for this tumor? 
No, um, I don't see any pet avid lymph nodes. The the CT scan does not suggest there's any greater than one any any lymph node greater than one centimeter. Um, it's not a central node. Uh, the size, you know, it's less than three centimeters. I I would proceed just with resection um, and lymph node sampling intraoperatively. Okay, so I I think that's reasonable. Um, but for a stage one disease, there, there are some guidelines about when you should consider invasive mediastinal staging with either a mediastinoscopy or, or EBUS and the techniques that we talked about last time. Um, and I've, I've listed these here and, and what they, they say is for nodes greater than one centimeter, any nodes with FDG activity on the, the PET scan for clinical T2 or, or greater tumors um, and then central tumors, it's, it's recommended to undergo uh, pathologic mediastinal staging, and this is just a, a little algorithm here. But um, you know, as Dr. Matisan always says, these are these are guidelines, and guidelines are, are only guidelines. Uh, so I wanted to to mention some of the the evidence that informs these these uh, these guidelines. So this was a, a meta analysis uh, published several years ago. It includes over a thousand patients with uh, PET determined clinical stage one non small cell lung cancer. Um, and if you uh, look at the, this top line here, the overall negative predictive value for mediastinal or, or N2 disease was 95% uh, by PET-CT. And then when you, you break that down to uh, 1A versus 1B disease, the negative predictive value of PET-CT decreases from about 95 to 85%. Uh, and that's where really where the, the suggestion for tumors greater than three centimeters that PET-CT may not be enough and you should consider invasive mediastinal staging. Um, and then when you look at different characteristics such of the tumor, such as the location and histology, which are these tables at the, the bottom here, uh, each line in the table rec or represents a different study that was included in the meta-analysis. And you can see that central tumors on the, um, the left here have a lower negative predictive value than peripheral tumors by PET, and then on the right, adenocarcinoma tends to have a negative lower predictive value than other histologies considered. Uh, and this has led some authors to, to conclude that invasive mediastinal staging should be considered in patients with known adenocarcinoma, though I know that's, that's not widely um, accepted. Um, you know, there's also been some studies that suggest a cutoff of, of tumors greater than two centimeters or those with high FDG uh, avid uptake. So right now, I just wanted to open it up to some of the, the experts and attendings on the line to see if this is the criteria that people follow. Their people had a different approach to invasive mediastinal staging for stage one lung cancer. Oh, <clears throat> I would just say, Michael Nudia, I'd just say that uh, you know the preferred choice method for staging right now is EBUS and not mediastinoscopy. That's been an accepted standard by the American College of Surgeons. Um, that standard will not change, but it's still measured against mediastinoscopy. The parameters that you mentioned about staging are, are correct. Um, and that uh, if you use EBUS for a PET positive lymph node, it turned out to be non-diagnostic or negative, then you have to go with mediastinoscopy as your sampling measure. Um, you know, stage one <clears throat> peripheral lesions, I think many of us will use the PET to, to, uh, to stage the mediastinum. And if it's quite small, I think you're safe. It's the two centimeters or larger to me that have higher N2 disease than if you lump them all as three centimeters or less. So I, I use a cutoff of two uh, for my invasive mediastinal staging rather than three. There's an interesting article that just came out in the annals looking at size of lymph node and N1 disease. I know we're talking about N2, but this is good to know for the residents. So a less than one centimeter, this is about 400 patients uh, in, in China, less than one centimeter, the incidence of N1 disease with PET negative was almost zero. When you move to two centimeters, the incidence of N1 disease moved to 20%. So I think with a PET negative um, initial study. So understand that PET has limitations. Michael Ludi, um, so if there are, if there are N1 disease, um, then you should do a mediastinoscopy, right? If there were N1 yeah. PET positive. Correct. 
Yeah, any N1 disease would uh, mandate that you get invasive mediastinal staging because those, pa those patients with N1 are higher likely to have N2 disease. Also, m make yourself clear that 95% um, sounds really high, yeah. but it's one in 20 who has disease where the prognosis would be significantly different and where preoperative treatment may be in indicated. So one in 20, um, do, do you want to perform EBUS for one in 20? But a, an examination that doesn't really have a lot of uh, complications, uh, very few complications. So I think it's not unreasonable to have the stance that you would perform uh, 20 EBUSes to find the one patient that has disease that changes management. Great, uh, so thank you for that. Um, so, so Mike, let's, uh, let's consider this case from a, a slightly different scenario. Let's say you have the same 62-year-old man with a 1.8 centimeter right upper lobe nodule found on a screening exam, but this time he's referred directly to you without a, a known diagnosis. Uh, how would you establish a diagnosis in this patient, or would you? Yeah, again, uh, you know, I would, I would look at the CT scan, determine the location of the nodule, if it's peripheral. Um, the CT guided biopsy is the least invasive way of establishing a, di a, 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 a histologic diagnosis. If you were somewhere central, and I'm not able to, if the IR guys cannot get to it, I would consider doing um, a wedge resection intraoperatively, get a frozen, and go from there. And that's only because he's at high risk of malignancy based on his smoking history, his age, and the appearance of the nodule, if you were to be speculated. Uh, and so then what would be some other techniques? You mentioned the, the percutaneous needle biopsy. Are there other? Um, yeah. yeah, there could be, a, you could do a, a trans uh, bronchial needle aspiration if it were to be central and it's, uh, it's somewhere uh, close to a, an accessible bronchi. Um, and um, I talked about percutaneous needle biopsy, CT guided biopsy and a, a, a VATS wedge. Um, and then navigational bronchoscopy would also add to that. Nav yes, navigational check, yeah. Uh, and this was just a, another point that I wanted to open up for discussion. Uh, there's no evidence-based guidelines, at least, that I'm uh, aware of in terms of um, a patient coming in with a suspected stage one lung cancer. I'm curious how people decide which patients they take straight to the OR to do a, a wedge and then a completion lobectomy or, or segment technique if it's positive versus trying to establish a preoperative diagnosis with some of the, the techniques that Mike had mentioned. I think you have to mention it to the patient as an option because the patient may then select a CAT scan guided needle biopsy. <laughs> um, but I don't feel strongly in this particular patient to obtain a preoperative diagnosis because it's a very peripheral nodule. It's not technically difficult to get a wedge resection. And thus, um, you save one examination that has its own costs and complications. And as somebody who doesn't deal with this problem clinically anymore, I can only tell you that I've always been somebody who wanted to know what everything was before I went into the operating room. I think it makes discussions with the family easier when you tell them you're going to have an operation and they know why. Uh, it's for cancer. Uh, if you go to the operating room, you rely on frozen sections. Sometimes that's good. Sometimes they're questionable. And then there's always the patient who has something else. You know, they have uh, TB, they have, uh, you know, boop, they have uh, some infectious agent. And uh, that, then the process drags on and then you're always questioned as to why you did it. It, it ends up sometimes in litigation. So I don't think you do it for avoiding litigation, but it's a part of it. But I think it's mostly that you want to know beforehand. It might, it might change how you would manage it. Uh, you may not have to then waste time in the OR doing a wedge, if you know what it is. Would the wedge compromise the uh, ultimate operation? Could it spread it by squeezing around it? So I, I, always, I always was very liberal of doing needle biopsies beforehand, but not everybody feels that way. I mean, there, there are some uh, institutional problems. So, for example, for those of you who are 
fortunate to work at Memorial, the frozen section analysis takes a long time and many of the surgeons don't want to wait. And so they've changed their whole practice pattern to get preoperative biopsies. Um, just, you know, the hard and fast would be any central lesion. You don't want to do diagnostic lobectomies if you, if you, you can avoid it. So all those should be biopsied before you take out a whole lobe or a whole anatomic segment. Things on the, on the periphery, to me, if your preclinical suspicion is high, I don't get the biopsy like Dr. Matheson does. I'm willing to do the, the diagnosis in the operating room. But again, you want your preclinical suspicion to be high. Um, and then you talk to the patient, just like Dr. Dr. Geis would say. Yeah, I agree with Mike. That's generally how I practice as well. When you're starting out um, as a young surgeon, it's always nice to control as many variables as you can before you get in the OR. So knowing exactly what you're going to do before you get there is, is nice if you can. And sometimes for a lesion like that where the, the wedge might distort the parenchyma, might make the lobectomy harder, you might not know what to do with some of the path, just get the needle biopsy if it helps you. The other is, you know, the two for one. So if you're someone who has the skill to do navigation, you could take them to navigate to to the, to the lesion, get your answer in the OR, and do your invasive staging at the same time. So I often employ that strategy. You also have to consider where you practice. If you practice at a center like MGH, then yes, a CT-guided needle biopsy is very likely to get you a good, um, good information. If you go out and practice in a community hospital or a hospital where you just find out after a while, that either the conduct of the CT got a needle biopsy or the pathology is not to your liking, then you are in a different situation than if you were to practice at Mass General. For example, I've always, uh, even though I practice at Newton Wellesley, all my CT got a needle biopsies have been done at Mass General because I can't stand to be introduced to the patient with a procedure that doesn't go well or that doesn't get you the maximal information that you want to get. And that then, by ordering something that doesn't get you the information, you are one down on the patient and, and you, you have to make up and you don't want to be in that situation. Yeah, that's true. It's really hard to explain what a non-diagnostic uh, FNA is to the patient. They, it, they have a hard time. They always think it's negative, And so that presents its own challenges. So you want your yield to be high in whatever procedure you propose for them. Great, thank you. Um, all right, so so Mike, we let's you know go back to our original patient, a clinical stage one uh, lung cancer of the right upper lobe. He's otherwise healthy and have PFTs that could tolerate a, a resection. So what would be your your next step in the treatment of this patient? I'm sorry, I will I will, I will schedule him for a right uh, well, that's right upper lobectomy and uh, lymph node sampling. We just find the lymph node sampling. All right, great. And uh, can you describe the steps of this operation? Yeah, so I'll gain access to the you know, thorax um, somewhere in the seven in the costal space, uh, mid axillary line, and I'll examine the, the thoracic cavity for any signs of metastasis, and um, then um, create my my working port um, somewhere in the fourth in the costal space anteriorly, and also posterior access port. And I'll um, mobilize the I start with the hilum and and open the mediastinal pleura and expose, isolate the uh, right upper lobe pulmonary vein. I, I, after identifying the media, the, the middle lobe vein and divide that, then dissect more of the the um, anterior trunk is anterior and identify the ongoing and uh, posterior ascending and divide those as well and um, then dissect the bronchus uh, to the right upper lobe, divide the the right upper lobe bronchus, and um, then complete the fissure, and then get my lymph nodes. I'll get station four, seven, and um, if any, station 10 as well. Okay, great. Um, and let's say while you're dissecting the anterior hilum, a, a small injury is made to the, the right PA. What are your strategies for managing this complication? Okay, and I'm assuming this is a right, uh, right PA? Yes. The main, sorry, the main right, the main, the main right PA. So if I, you know, first I'll get, I'll get, uh, I'll apply pressure with a sponge stick. Uh, I'll let anesthesia be aware of what's going on. Um, get some blood um, available, and um, 
at that point, I'll convert to a thoracotomy just because I feel more comfortable with uh, the dealing with the injury through an open approach. If it's a small injury, um, again, it's the right PA, you know, may not be controlled with pressure. So I'll convert to a thoracotomy and then get proximal control. You need to open the pericardium, get more proximal control and repair it with proline such as the sutures. All right, so let's, uh, let's move on to a, a second case example. Um, let's say this time you're referred to a 70-year-old hey, woman. Me, hey, Andrea, let me stop yeah. you just for a second and okay. ask three questions. What if you see a, a, an unsuspected pleural met and, and it's the patient you described? What yeah. would you do then? Yeah, so I, will, I would send that for frozen and um, wait before I proceed. But in the meantime, I would start getting lymph nodes. I would sample lymph nodes. And um, hopefully by the, time, by the time I'm done sampling lymph nodes, the biopsy uh, of that, the frozen biopsy is back. And if it's metastasis, then I will abort the uh, operation. I refer the patient for um, chemotherapy and um, palliative chemotherapy. Yeah, that, that's, the, that's the safest and purest answer. There are some times where you might say, well, young, healthy, low risk, uh, uh, you might go ahead and continue. What if you had an unsuspected N2 node that you happened, you said you sampled nodes, you didn't think there was anything, but you sent them down to the pathologist and they say, oh, there was one that had, uh, uh, was positive. What would you do then? Same, same scenario, thought to be clinically stage one, uh, but your sample shows uh, a positive node, N2 node, while you're in the operating room and you've done the... And, right. And is this prior to me starting my uh, dissection? Uh, you, you started. Yeah, you have started. You haven't done anything that uh, is irreversible, but... Uh, okay. Yeah. So uh, here, my two options. Um, while I'm there, since I already know the N2 is positive, and um, so I would... I would um, I would complete the lobectomy and do a mediastinal lymph node dissection. So I'll actually, you know, get a fluid lymphadenectomy and refer the patient for adjuvant chemo. Um, alternatively, uh, assuming if you've not violated any claims, could abort that and, and um, send the patient for induction chemotherapy and then bring them back for the lobectomy, and I, I'm not sure if that's that's that the safe, that's a safe answer, but maybe you can you can correct me. Yeah, I think uh, when you used to do thoracotomies uh, and you were in the chest, it was a much different uh, emotional decision to make. But I think in VATS, uh, you could make that argument. There was a period of time where people thought that you ought to close, no matter what you had done, if you were even doing an open, and give them neoadjuvant therapy. I, I never thought that was a good idea, but I think in VATS, it's something you at least have to think about, and it will be something that you may hear about on some oral exam. What would you do under those circumstances? All you have to do is just have a thoughtful process and uh, be able to justify what you're going to do. I think VATS has changed that uh, paradigm a little bit. Yeah, I agree. Um, one thing, just a couple things to add to think about is if you have a single station microscopic positive node, you might want to check the other stations. Because if you have multi-station N2 disease, you should absolutely should not proceed forward. If you have a single station, it's microscopic, and you know, you're know you there and you feel like the patient could recover and get on to um, adjuvant therapy in a reasonably timely fashion, like it's not a complicated lobe, you're not gonna have a prolonged hospital stay, and you feel like you just have single station, then I think it's okay to proceed. Because it's all about getting them on to you know, whatever, either induction or adjuvant therapy in a timely fashion. Great, thank you. Um, all right, so uh, Mike, moving on to a, a second case uh, example. So this time you're referred to a 70-year-old woman. She's got a 50-pack year history of COPD, or of smoking and COPD, and she comes in with a, a 1.2 centimeter biopsy proven right upper lobe uh, adenocarcinoma in the apical segment of the upper lobe. Uh, she undergoes a, a staging workup that includes a, a PET CT, and this shows FDG uptake in the right upper lobe nodule, but no hyalur, mediastinal, or distant disease. Um, and then her preoperative evaluation is also notable for uh, some poor PFTs, which you can see here, FDG1 of, of 0.8 liters, a DLCO of 45. Yeah. Um, so what are your next steps in the treatment of this patient? 
Yeah, so assuming that there are no other remarkable findings on the history and physical exam, um, although one thing I would like to know in the history is her functional status. I like to know how many, you know, in general, how function, functional she is. Um, and uh, assuming that the um, EKG was normal and the PFTs, uh, you know, I, I'm, my PFTs are worse on just because her FEV1s is, is, is a low, low marginal and the DLCO. Um, I will discuss, you know, I would skip the mediastinal staging in this scenario, but I will discuss a sub lobar resection with this patient, um, just given her age, her pulmonary um, reserve, and um, the size. Um, and uh, my, my option would be a segmentectomy, um, um, you know, or, or even, even, you know, a, a, a wide wedge resection. Uh, again, I think it would be something that I would consider in this patient, sublobar resection. Michael, could you imagine a situation where you would consider a lobectomy in someone like that? Give me a circumstance where you might consider a lobectomy. Uh, if the tumor was in a um, central location um, uh, or if, you know, I, I, if the tumor was in a central location, I, I, I would, I would, just do a, a, a and you have to give me some other parts of, of, of the patient. So if it's a 5'4 patient who weighs like uh, uh, 55 pounds, then probably 800 milliliters of FE1 is enough for her. Also, these are just numbers. You want to really know what the patient does with these numbers. And if the patient has a good exercise capacity, then probably a lobectomy is well tolerated. And the other circumstance, if these numbers are real, uh, is ask yourself where which lobe is involved here it's the right upper lobe so there are circumstances where the right upper lobe is completely destroyed and um, the patient has very hyperinflated uh, yes. lungs and the diaphragm is flat and and doesn't move with inspiration so then you might do some type of volume reduction by performing a lobectomy and then you could really use a lobectomy to make the patient better. There are some patients with emphysema who have better lung function after the lobectomy. Yeah. And the final thought I would have is, if a patient has poor exercise capacity with these kind of numbers, is you can make them better before the operation. Rehab. Yeah, yeah I pulmonary, would push, pulmonary rehab. Yeah. Right. I'd push back on you a little bit for skipping uh, yeah. the mediastinoscopy yeah. in this patient. This is exactly the kind of patient you don't want to be in the OR and find incidental and to disease. Even if the suspicion is low, if they are medically tenuous for lung surgery, you're going to feel really bad about incidental and to disease. Okay. Yeah. And would, I, I was going to think, I was thinking of also doing a quantitative QT scan. I don't know if that would you know, change my, my, my plan. Um, I thought. Yeah. Yeah, and you can get a lot, just like what Henning was alluding to on, on the, you know, the way that right upper lobe looks or the upper lobe yeah. can give you a good sense of if you're going to help this patient with volume reduction, because you do do that sometimes. You can do a very simple test, which is an inspiration and expiration chest radiograph, but you have to be clear that for the expiration, the patient is given all the time that the patient needs to exhale. And then with complete exhalation, get another chest x-ray. And then you measure the diaphragmatic excursion. And if the diaphragmatic excursion is, say, half an inch or less, you have a winner because uh, a right upper lobe is going to restore diaphragmatic excursion. All right. So let's say you do the, uh, the mediastinoscopy. Um, you have a biopsy of station 2, 4, and 7. It shows no evidence of, of microscopic disease. Um, she has pretty poor exercise tolerance, um, and your uh, VQ scan is, is not available. Um, so let's say you decide to proceed with a, a sub-lobar resection. Uh, can you describe your approach to this? Okay, so um, if I'm doing advanced, same same approach, I'll get, I'll get access to the, the pleural cavity, and I'll examine rule-out metastasis. Um, in this case, I will also start my dissection process similar to a uh, right upper lobe, except that I'll, I would extend my, my dissection to, um, to the segmental uh, vessels and, and segmental bronchi. Um, assuming that that's an anterior uh, right upper lobe um, um, nodule, then 
um, when I gain this access to the, the anterior segment, um, of the anterior segmental arteries and, and vein and um, bronchi, then uh, I'll divide those. But before I divide the bronchi, I, what, one thing I've seen done is it, you clamp that, that bronchi and, and inflate and ask the anesthesia to um, give a breath. And then you can mark out the area that's, that's uh, atelectatic and um, then divide that. I think, I, if I remember, there's a, there's a more classic way of doing a second technique by following the, the, following the pulmonary veins and um, sort of peeling it off. I think, uh, I haven't seen that, but I know that that's something that's, that's more anatomically um, uh, feasible, feasibly done. Yeah, in, in robotics now we can inject ICG and use the near infrared firefly imaging and it shows the perfused segments and the devitalized segment that you divided the vessels to. Okay, um, so thank, thanks Mike. I also just wanted to, to highlight, you mentioned a couple of these, but important points for considering the appropriate patient to perform a, a segment technique and for primary lung cancer. Um, and it's, it's generally recommended that this technique be reserved for tumors that are less than two centimeters, that are in the outer third of the lung, so peripheral tumors, uh, and contained within a, an anatomic segment. Uh, I think it's also important that you can get an appropriate margin with your resection. So things that are quoted in the literature is a, a margin of at least one to two centimeters or a, a margin distance that's greater than the diameter of the primary tumor. And that's really been shown to decrease the rates of, of primary recurrence. Um, and then this technique is also reserved for patients without evidence of, of nodal metastases. Uh, and at least currently it's, it's limited um, you know, we'll talk about some of the, the data about this, but limited to patients who can't tolerate a, a low bar resection, elderly patients, and then it can be considered in patients with synchronous multiple primary lung cancers or, you know, not as it relates to primary lung cancer, but patients undergoing a metastasectomy where you're trying to preserve lung function. Uh, I think it's also really important to, to study the preoperative imaging to make sure that you understand the segmental branching of the bronchovascular system because there can be a lot of, of anatomic variation. And when you're trying to find those branches in a segment technique, it's, it's important to understand the, the anatomy of the patient. Um, and I'll, I'll pause here to see if there's any uh, comments from the attendings on their specific technique or approach to segment technique. Um, Dr. Schumacher, you mentioned the the ICG with robotics, I think that really changes things a lot. It's a nice technique. Yeah, so that's helpful. You just, you divide, you make sure you divide the vessels prior um, and as well as the bronchi, and then you can just inject five milligrams of ICG and it shows up quite nicely. The ones there, it doesn't work as well as um, if you have a really anthracotic uh, lungs and sometimes severe emphysema, you don't see the perfusion to the other um, segments as well. <clears throat> um, and then one thing I would comment on, you know, if you're doing this for smaller lesions and something more than like a GGO, then it's it's always wise to check the, you know, surrounding lymph nodes. So let the sub node draining that segment to the level 11, um, you know, you can freeze that. And if it is positive, then you really should go on to a completion lobectomy if the patient can tolerate it. So that's one strategy you can incorporate in your practice of doing segmentectomies. But I think in this day and age with all our lung cancer screening and the GGOs that we're picking up that are enlarging that we're operating on, I think it's very good to have this technique in your armamentarium. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, great. So I think you know the, the debate about low bar versus sub low bar resection is, is very interesting and, and certainly an ongoing controversy in thoracic surgery. So I wanted to spend some time just talking about some of the important trials and, and data that informs these, these discussions and the decision. Um, so the first study that I wanna mention um, is this study. It was published by the Lung Cancer Study Group in 1995. And to date, it's the only prospective randomized controlled trial on low bar versus sub low bar resection for patients with clinical stage one uh, non-small cell lung cancer. Uh, this study was conducted in the 80s uh, ended up randomizing 247 patients with clinical T1 and 0 disease to undergo either a lobectomy or a sublobar resection. 
Um, and it's important to note that all of these patients were deemed to be able to tolerate a lobectomy by their preoperative evaluation and PFTs. And then prior to randomization in the OR, the surgical teams made sure, or they made an assessment of the tumor and made sure that it was appropriate for a sublobar resection if they were randomized to that group. Uh, in, in the sublobar group, patients either underwent an anatomic segmentectomy or a non-anatomic wedge resection with uh, margins of at least two centimeters. And this table on the, the right here, it shows the breakdown of operations that were performed. And you can see that in the sublobar group, about a third underwent wedge resections, whereas two thirds underwent anatomic segmentectomies. Uh, and these were the, the major results of the trial. So, they found that perioperative morbidity and mortality was about the same between groups, but that long-term survival was shorter for the group that underwent sublobar resection. And you can see here a clear divergence in the survival curves after about three years. Uh, and then when you break it down to look at the, the cause of death, this corresponded to about a 30% increase in uh, the overall death rate and then a 50% increase in the, the cancer-specific death rate. Um, although I did want to point out that you know, it's not quite reaching statistical significance with a p-value of 0 .0, 0.08, but certainly suggests a, a trend in that direction. Um, and then they also found a threefold increase in the rate of local recurrence in the limited resection group, and this seemed to apply to both patients that underwent a wedge and a, a segment. So the, the main conclusion of this study uh, was that lobectomy offered significant superior control of, of local recurrence um, and suggested uh, improved long-term survival. And this really established lobectomy as the gold standard for surgical research or for surgical resection for, for decades. Um, however, I want to note that this study was conducted over 30 years ago and there's, there have been many advances in perioperative imaging and surgical technique. And so I think the, the question comes up is, do these questions still apply in our, our current era? Do you see any limitations of this trial either? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, this was all based predominantly on, on chest X-ray and CT, um, you know, sort of old CT screening. And so I think some of the lesions that we see now, ground glass, you know, pure ground glass, they don't necessarily apply um, to this particular study. You know, I think you have a mix of techniques, the wedge versus the anatomic segmentectomy. Um, so all of those, I think, are, are some limitations. Yeah, and the, the size was larger, and they didn't differentiate wedge versus segment in this as well. So an anatomic resection versus uh, just a wedge. Um, so that's why, I don't know if you're mentioning the current study? Yep. Okay. All right. Um, so, you know, I think people have tried to, to get at this question, and, and since that trial, there have been numerous both population and then single institution retrospective analyses that have, have tried to answer this with newer data. Uh, this is a, a table from a, a nice review on the topic and it summarizes some of the larger population-based analyses. And you can see that about half favor lobectomy in terms of a survival benefit, whereas the other half suggests an equivalent survival between the lobectomy and the sublobar group. And you know, this is interesting, I think when you look uh, a little more carefully at the actual studies. Um, the studies that suggest an equivalent overall survival, they're now applying these more specifically to patients with tumors that are smaller size, so less than one to two centimeters and a, a more indolent histology. Um, and while this, this data, I think it's, it's very interesting, I think you also have to be careful with the interpretation uh, and recognize that large databases such as SEER or the NCDB uh, that were used, they lack a lot of granular clinical information. And I think it's impossible to tell from these databases whether sublobar resection is applied as more of a compromise uh, procedure in a patient that's, that's more debilitated or couldn't tolerate a lobectomy or as an intentional parenchymal sparing operation in an otherwise healthy individual. Um, so some of the, the single institution retrospective analyses, they can help to answer that question and with some more granular detail. And there have been many that have been published in the, the last 30 years. I just wanted to, to give one particular example here that I, I thought was a nice stratified analysis. Uh, so this is a, a study out of Japan. It looked at 140 patients with clinical stage 1A lung cancer. And it stratified their analysis by patients who underwent a standard lobectomy, 
compared to those who were otherwise healthy and underwent an intentional parenchymal sparing segmentectomy with a lymph node dissection versus those who underwent a, uh, a sublobar resection that was due to compromised cardiopulmonary function. And this, this table below, this gives some of the baseline characteristics of the study sample. And you can see that in the, the two sublobar groups, those in the, the compromised group, they tended to be older. They had slightly larger tumors compared to the, those in the intentional uh, sublobar segment technique group. Uh, and these were the, the results that they found. So patients undergoing an intentional segmentectomy with lymph node dissection, the overall five-year survival was 86%, which was similar to patients undergoing standard lobectomy, which had a five-year survival of about 87. Uh, and then in contrast, the compromised sublobar resection group had significantly worse survival, um, and local regional recurrence um, was also worse in this group where it was similar between the, the lobectomy and the intentional um, sublobar group. So, you know, what, is, what are the takeaways, I think, from these different studies? I think, generally speaking, the best randomized evidence we have suggests superiority of lobectomy over sublobar resection. However, that is uh, older data, and I think there is a, a group of patients with stage one disease that have specific tumor characteristics um, and resection parameters that are associated with equivalent survival between lobectomy and then a, a segmentectomy approach. And I, I've lifted, listed some of those parameters here. I also wanna point out that there are two large randomized clinical trials, uh, one that just finished enrollment and one that's currently ongoing um, in the US and Japan that are looking at this uh, specific issue. So we should have some updated high quality clinical trial evidence over the next several years. Um, this table just lists the, the two trials and compares them to the original lung cancer study group uh, from the 80s here in terms of some of the details. You can see that the, uh, the study out of Japan compares only segmentectomy versus lobectomy, whereas the U.S. trial allows segmentectomy versus a non-anatomic wedge compared to lobectomy, both for small tumors less than two centimeters. Um, and we're running a little bit short on time. Um, you know, I kind of wanted to run through a couple of scenarios in terms of follow-up and pathology, but maybe we can talk about these later. Um, I'll respect the time and uh, stop here. Okay. Great job, Andrea. Yeah, thank you, Andrea. Great job. Good job, Andrea. Good job on your uh, research presentation the other night. Yeah, that well. was a good one. Thank you.